We're going to hop right in. We have been in the parables for quite some time now. We are rearing the end, but parables, um, they continue to be defined as earthly stories with a heavenly impact. You've, you've heard that week after week. We're, we're saying that on purpose. We repeat ourselves so that it's kind of ingrained in the back of your mind. They're, they're earthly stories with a heavenly impact. And what these stories sought to do is they sought to help those who were listening to Jesus, the ones that were around Jesus, to help, they, they wanted to, to help them to understand better heavenly principles that we can relate to. So a lot of these stories that Jesus was telling to the surrounding people, they're very practical. They, they, they were intended to make sense. Wherever Jesus was, like he would use the physical location and he would, he would use those physical locations as metaphors to further explain the story. So, so these stories made sense. They were practical. And each of these stories, they had an underlying, deeper meaning that we're called to live out. They, they had something underneath the surface. They meant, they meant something deeper than what, what was just, you know, a metaphor through the story. And maybe you found yourself in this boat, but when I was in elementary school, I, I vaguely remember an assignment, and, and my teacher, she assigned this assignment as homework, and the responsibility of this assignment was I was to go home, I was to get out all of the arts and crafts that I could find, the, the tissue paper, the craft paper, the scissors, the glue sticks, and what I was supposed to do is I was supposed to get a big piece of poster board, and on this poster board... I was supposed to draw a tree. And now, you see, this wasn't any normal tree. It, it wasn't that I was supposed to, you know, choose my favorite tree even. But the intention was to make each leaf, each branch of this tree to resemble a different member of my family. I was building a family tree. And, and so I, I began to get out all the supplies. I'm making a mess all over the kitchen table. And I remember as I'm going through this project, as a young elementary school kid, the different positions of each member in my family. I, I remembered how my great-grandfather on my mom's side used to work on the railroads. I remember both of my grandpas, both my mom's dad and my dad's dad, they're both pastors. I remember both the roles of my parents, how my mom and my dad both work within the church. And you've probably found yourself in a position, if you've ever built a family tree before, where you soon begin to realize that as you glue down all these different leaves, all these different sticks, that it actually doesn't look like a tree unless each of those pieces is connected to something. They're all connected to the source, to the trunk and its roots. Everything has to remain connected. Everything has to remain connected. We're going to be in John 15 this morning. John 15, if you have a Bible, go ahead and flip there. This is the parable of the true vine. It, this is, this is Jesus' message to his disciples, and it's this message to remain connected, to abide, to stay, and to live in union with Christ. It's, it's this responsibility that he's actually calling us to live out, to be a branch, to stay connected. And not only to stay connected, but to stay connected no matter what. And Jesus' priority this whole entire time, the whole entire time he's telling the story, the priority is on connection. He doesn't want us to miss that. The priority is to remain, to abide, to live in union with him. And these central chapters of both John 14 and John 15, they're recited to, they're, they're called the Last Supper Discourse. And, and maybe you've heard this before. 
But by the time that this conversation about Jesus describing himself as the true vine would have taken place, the words that Jesus is about to say to us in John 15 are actually the last words to his disciples before he's taken away to be crucified. He's, he spent three years doing ministry with 12 of his closest friends. And in this moment, he's kind of letting us in on, on the conversation. This is what he's saying to his disciples as he's literally walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, about to be betrayed by one of those 12 closest friends. And so within this moment, within this story, context is king. Context becomes clear. And what's actually shifting between chapter 14 to the parable in chapter 15 is all about circumstance. It's all about context. It's what's happening all around Jesus, all around his disciples. If you recall chapter 14, Jesus is sharing a meal. He's in the upper room. And the message all along has been, believe in me. I am who I say I am. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Yes, there is going to be circumstances that are difficult. Yes, there's going to be hardship and trouble that comes your way. But believe in me. Believe only in me. And that conversation actually concludes by Jesus giving the disciples a gift. And he gives them this gift of the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I love the detail that says the Holy Spirit is another advocate. He's not the advocate. The advocate all this time has been Jesus. But he's giving another advocate, someone to help them even further. And then it actually says that this advocate is for their behalf. Judas, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, at this point, he's no longer with the crew. He, he's already gone to exchange policies for the betrayal of Jesus. He's, he's going to get paid. And so Judas, he, he leaves the table. He does the duties that he's obligated to do. And then what happens is that Jesus himself stands up. He, he gets from this kind of crouch position. He stands up, and what he does is he actually invites the disciples to follow. And Jesus, he starts walking away from the table. He doesn't necessarily tell the disciples where he's going. He doesn't give them any clarification and say, oh, here's where we're going, follow me. But he gets up, he leaves. The disciples follow, and I guarantee that this walk, it probably felt a little tense. It probably felt a little different. They, they didn't quite put all the pieces together. They didn't quite understand, Jesus, why aren't you giving us any clarity? Why aren't you giving us any clarification? It probably felt dawning. They, they may have even felt sick to their stomach. They didn't know what was going on. But the walk as they continue to walk, begins to actually feel a little typical. It feels routine. It feels practical. And Jesus' footsteps ultimately are headed towards the Garden of Gethsemane. What he's doing is he's, he's walking to the garden. He invites his disciples to follow. And Jesus is going to spend the last few minutes before his death in holy prayer with his Father. And I don't want you to miss this. There's an interesting detail in the story. Because somehow, some way, Judas had already excused himself. But he knew where to find Jesus. That's, that's a detail that we don't necessarily see. But Judas, he knew where Jesus was. He met them in the garden. So in my mind, there, there's 
kind of this idea that this, this is a routine walk. They've been here before, and it's not that they've been here before because Judas has betrayed Jesus before. This is, of course, the first time this is happening and the only time it's happening. But Judas knew where to meet Jesus. He knew where Jesus was at. He knew to go to the garden. And Jesus, he clearly knew the timing of the events that were to come. He knew what was coming to him. And the disciples, they're still not understanding. They, they don't understand. And I guarantee you that the, the mindset of the disciples is they're asking all these questions. Jesus, why? Why here? Why now? What, what's going on? And Jesus kind of removes himself. And so, what, what do you say? What, what can you say? If you were Jesus, and you're in this circumstance, you know what's to come. What do you say? What do you do? And in a way, Jesus is preparing his last words. And I told you, context is everything. The disciples are tangibly following through a garden. They're noticing the trees. They're noticing the plants. The dirt's probably kicking up behind their sandals. They're hearing the sounds of the insects and the bugs. And then chapter 15 of John's gospel begins. Starting in verse 1. I am the true grapevine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. It makes sense. They're walking through a physical garden. And the metaphor of the message, the metaphor that Jesus is saying when he says, I am the true vine. It's actually holding more of a weight because of the physical location of where Jesus is at. Vines are very common throughout imagery of the Bible. They're, they're used time and time again. It, it wasn't new to the disciples. The temple itself in Israel was actually embedded at the, at the archway, at the gateway, with a golden vine. To get into the sanctuary, you had to walk underneath a vine. Vines were everywhere. You walk throughout Israel, you'll see them hanging out of a window. So context, context is clear. It's making sense to the disciples. And then picking up in verse 5, he reiterates his point again. He says, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. It's the second time he said it. First time was, I am the true vine. Second time is, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Why does Jesus feel the need to repeat himself? He doesn't want us to forget. He's painting a mental picture. He wants it to stick in his disciples' mind. And take hold of the context one more time. Jesus' conversation that he just finished with his disciples is that he's sending another advocate. He's sending the Holy Spirit for them, to them, on their behalf, because he himself is about to depart from them. 
And his message, his message is not only a message about being connected, but staying connected. Continued connection. An ongoing connection. Even when he himself is about to depart from his disciples, he's leaving them. His priority, his message, his bottom line, his last words. Stay connected. The priority is on connection. And his words, what are they? I am the true vine. Which, of course, implies that you are not. (laughs) I am the true vine. You're a branch. And take note in verse 1 again. Not only am I the vine, I am the true vine. True vine. Within the Old Testament... The metaphor of the vine is used time and time again. And every single time that this metaphor is used, it's being used to describe God's people. But every single time that this metaphor of the vine is being used to describe God's people, it's actually in a negative tone. It's in this tone of correction. It's actually God's people being criticized and reprimanded for the lifestyle that they've been living. They're actually called useless in the book of Ezekiel. They're called overgrown and said to produce bitter fruit. In the book of Isaiah, they're described as moving farther away from God than closer to him in Hosea chapter 1. And what Jesus is doing in John 15 is he overturns that metaphor. He's giving a new meaning, a new definition. He says, he is the vine. And not only the vine, but he's the true vine. And now his people are branches. Jesus is proving what he's saying is we see how you tried to take control. We saw what happened when you called yourself the vine. And the reality is you're actually not capable of being in that position. You're not capable of being the vine. You aren't bearing fruit of which I've called you to bear. So here's what we're going to do. I am now the vine. You're a branch. And now it is through me and only me that you are able to bear much fruit. Therefore, the job of the vine is to make sure that we have the strength, the joy, the patience, the peace, and self-control that we need. It's not your responsibility, it's not my responsibility to find that within ourselves. That's the job of the vine, is to provide, to make sure that we have what we need. In John 15, verse 6, he's, he's pretty vocal about what happens when you try to produce fruit without the guidance of the vine. He says in John 15, verse 6, They are thrown away as they are viewed useless. They they wither. And then what they do is they're actually thrown into a pile to be burned. The responsibility of the vine, of the true vine, is to provide. Provide what you need. Now, the responsibility of a branch to be a branch. Allow him to produce in our lives what we are less than capable of producing on our own. He wants to do for us what we are incapable of doing all by ourselves. You're a branch. I'm a branch. We're branches. And as a branch, There's going to be hard circumstances. There's going to be uncertainty that comes within our lives. And out of humility, what we're actually called to do 
is remember that we're a branch. We're not the vine. And as a branch, there's periods of time where it's required for us to be pruned, to go through the process for shaping, for equipping. And that's not an easy and a quick procedure. But here's the thing. It's always beneficial. It's actually always a rewarding process that takes place for our good. Because what happens is when we try to make an effort to be the vine, we connect ourselves to things that aren't the true vine. There's other vines out there. False vines, if you will. And the thing about these these vines, these things that are false vines, the truth about them is that they're not connected to the source. They're not connected to the true vine. And ultimately, what they're going to do is they're going to disguise themselves trying to make you think that they are the true vine. They're trying to take the place of the true vine in our lives. And what I find ironic, backtrack with me a little bit, is that Jesus is saying the words, abide in me, remain in me. And not only remain in me, but I will remain in you. Well, where's Judas? Judas is in the act of connecting himself to a false vine. It's this false idea of pride. He's actually betraying one of his closest friends that he's done ministry with for three years. He's finding his source in something else. He knows who Jesus is. He followed in the same footsteps, and he's connecting himself to a false vine. He's in the act of it. He's caught in the middle. It's a little more practical for us. What what do we view as false vines? I think we view success as a false vine. If, If only we could have this. Only if I could get to this point, then my life would be better. We view friendships, we view relationships as a false vine. If only I was friends with that person, then this would happen. If only my relationship with so-and-so looked like this, then my life would be this. And maybe your list looks a little bit different. I don't think the list stops there. It actually continues. But it's only through the true vine, Jesus, that you are able to produce long-lasting good fruit. In other words, Jesus produces in us that which a false vine will never be capable of producing. But your responsibility, my responsibility, stay connected. To abide You can only actually live rightly and serve him effectively if you are connected. And it's not that we're incapable of having any activity without Jesus. I've seen people that would say, oh, my life is perfectly fine without Jesus. I'm content the way I am. I I don't need him. But what happens is that it's really difficult to do anything of real and lasting eternal value without him. And this this process of pruning, this process of shaping, this process of equipping is not Jesus' way of telling us, oh, you're not doing good enough. Oh, this is is not Jesus' way of him correcting us for doing something wrong. It's not discipline. But the process of pruning and equipping is so that you may bear more fruit than ever before. Scripture tells us that. He gives us what we need, and then he guides us so that you may remain further connected. There's this fancy Greek word. It's minate. Minate. And what that means is to persist, to pursue, 
to remain, to stay. And you hear that and maybe you realize that every single one of those definitions is present tense. It's a present tense verb, which implies that abiding in Christ, abiding in the presence of the true vine is a continual behavior. Putting Jesus as a permanent resident in your life rather than a short-term guest. It's this idea of depending on Jesus as the source for everything, starting with your own life. You draw life from him when you're connected. It actually becomes necessary. It becomes essential so that you may receive insight and guidance and wisdom from him. And the promise for us, what we get back in return is that if you continue, continually abide in him, he will abide in you. He abides in us. It's a mutual relationship. It's not only restricted to us abiding in Jesus, but that he in return abides in us. We're in vital connection with him. And the parable in Luke 15, it's a twofold conversation. It's not only a parable of who we are, but it's a parable of how we ought to live. The question can't be left untouched. How do we stay connected? We have to answer that question. How do we find in Christ the fruit that we have been trying to produce all this time by ourselves? How do we be a branch to the fullest extent? So much so that is now embedded in our lives and has become a matter of our identity. The calling continues to be abide in him. And when we do so, he will give us what we need. And the answer to that question, the answer to the question, how do we stay connected? The key word being stay is to begin living by the reality that we have to value relation and relationship to the true vine over trying to produce results. There's this backwards way of thinking where we value results in our lives over connection to Jesus. The idea that we try to bear fruit on our own is more important to us than the one of whom we are connected to. It's not about what we do. It's not about how much we try to get done. The priority, the priority is on connection. It's about who we are connected to, not how much we produce. And we think that the more we produce, the stronger the connection and the better the connection to the vine. We think to ourselves, now that I've met my goal of, I'll be more highly viewed by Jesus. Or I've done, so now Jesus will love me more. And the heart of God, the heart of God has always been connection over results. It's always been a matter of relationship first. It's not the other way around. It's this concept that's made up by man that the more and more fruit we produce in our lives, that God views us higher. But it has always been, it always will be, that relation and connection to the true vine is what will lead to the production of genuine, lasting fruit. And what I love, what I love is the chapter before chapter 15, chapter 14, Jesus ends the conversation by promising that gift of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And what happens, what happens to each of us is that when we stay connected, when we remain connected, when we pursue, when we persist, and we realize that we're not the vine, we're a branch the Holy Spirit that is promised to the disciples in John 14 is the same Spirit that produces in us 
the same kind of fruit. Galatians makes that fruit clear. It's a fruit of love. It's a fruit of joy. A fruit of peace. A fruit of patience. A fruit of kindness. A fruit of goodness. A fruit of faithfulness. A fruit of gentleness. And a fruit of self control. And I'll be honest. Maybe you hear that list and you're actually thinking to yourself, I'm incapable of producing that. I I don't know what it's like to produce love. I don't know what it's like to produce self-control. I don't know what it's like to produce peace. I I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to be patient Or kind. And the truth this morning is that there's things that we want produced in our lives, but the reason that we can't see the product is because we've tried to produce it all alone. We've tried to live in the position of the vine. We think to ourselves that we're actually better off by ourselves. Rather than being called to our responsibility as a branch, there's a lesson here to be learned that our position, our responsibility, who we're called to be through John 15, is a branch. Allow Jesus to be the vine, allow Him to continue to use us so that he may bear good fruit for you, through you. And our challenge, remain as a branch. Have continued connection to pursue, to persist. Not measuring yourself by the product and how much you strive to achieve and get done but live in the truth that what remains important is who you abide in, who you remain connected to. What remains important, the most important, is that you don't measure yourself by the product of how much you try to achieve and get done but that you live in the truth. You stay connected. You abide. You persist. And you live in the importance of knowing the true vine, who it is that you are to abide in, to remain in. Pray with me this morning.